live another chat with corin here i'm here with uh not one of my friends uh hopefully by the end of this conversation and i guess through twitter we we've, we've become friends or are now friends or i like to say that we are friends you seem like a nice guy um andrew here i don't know if you want to say your last name or not g <laughs> Guterelli. No okay. one ever gets it right, so you can just say Andrew G. <laughs> okay, Andrew G. Uh, reached out to me on Twitter. Uh, he is a follower of mine. He likes a lot of my tweets. He's very supportive of what I'm putting out there, even if it's some some hot garbage. I always see a like from you, so I appreciate that. Um, but you reached out to me because you had mentioned you are involved with Bernie Sanders at your um, Ohio University. Is that correct? Yeah, so I'm the president, really co-president. I have I have two other people that kind of helped me start it, uh, Nick and Julia. I got to give them a little bit of a shout out. But um, I, I was kind of the initial one who came up with the idea for the org. And uh, we're basically the students for Bernie chapter at my school. And our, our school mascot is the Bobcats. So our name is Bobcats for Bernie. It kind of fits with the B yeah. for Bernie as well. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So uh, just to give a little bit of background, you reached out to me on Twitter and mentioned you would love to come on because um, you saw I do some chats with people. Um, and get the word out a little bit about what you're doing on campus. Um, and I'm always, I get a lot of messages that are always trying to reach out to Kyle or something like that, or um, just a lot of like, not dumb messages, but stuff that I, I just don't, I've got a lot going on. Um, but you wrote a nice note and it seemed legit. And sometimes Kyle says, you know, you got to turn your messages off because, you know, people are phony and they'll say all this and that other thing. Um, but you sent a nice message, and I appreciate that. And I wanted to have you on just to chat a little bit about what's been going on, um, what you've got going on. So basically, the the floor is yours. If you want to tell people a little bit about what you're doing at Ohio University there, and um, what what your involvement is with the Bernie campaign over there. Yeah. So being that Ohio is not one of the the first couple states, our primaries on March 17th, the campaign, the Sanders campaign, doesn't really have an office set up in the state of Ohio yet. So we've kind of been like the actual leaders of the entire Sanders campaign in Ohio. That's awesome. Um, in fact, uh, we were actually uh, invited to lunch with Susan Sarandon last fall. So wow. we got to drive up to Columbus and we met with her for like an hour and she was incredibly down to earth and a wonderful person. So that was that was a really cool experience. You, now, uh, may I ask how old you are and what year you are at Ohio yeah, University? Yeah, I'm, I'm 23. So I'm, I'm a super senior. Okay. I'm a big um, but I'm, I'm in a, I'm studying aviation, so it's pretty much a five-year program, going to flight school and all that on top of regular classes. So I'm one of the few people involved politically who's not a political science major, and that's one of the things I, I'm really trying to push to like people who listening, people listening who aren't like working in politics. That's why I thought it was great that you had Justin Jackson on the other yeah. day because like he's he's a football player, and you know like similarly, I'm in a field that like I'm going to be an airline pilot. That's not really connected to it, politics directly. But I think it's really important that we have people from all different walks of life that join political movements because at the end of the day, people like Bernie, his policies, they aren't there for like political analysts. Bernie's policies are there for everyday people, whether you're a janitor, a school teacher, whatever you do. Everyone needs to get involved because politics affects everyone. Yeah, that's perfectly said, man. Uh, and I, I applaud you for getting involved in something that, you know, obviously isn't going to be your uh, potential field, you know, um, because you're right. Politics, it relates to all of us, whether or not, you know, you want to think you're involved in it or not. You know, whether you drive on roads, you have kids, you, you, you everyone goes to school, you pay your taxes. So like all of this, whether you like it or not, is going to get dealt by somebody else. So why not take grasp of it and, you know, understand a little bit better of what's going on? Um, let me ask you, did you even know who Susan Sarandon was, uh, when, when she reached out? Cause you're like probably a little bit before her movie time. Yeah. So I had heard the name, but I honestly, I had only heard of her from being involved with Bernie before, yeah. but uh, one of our, our members, she's actually a freshman. She was 18 at the time and she was a massive Susan Sarandon oh, fan. Really? So it was interesting. She was four years younger than me and, and knew who she was, but I, I was not really familiar with her work, but when I told my parents and kind of my uncles and, and my, like, oh, I told my grandpa that I met her, he was, uh, like, oh, well, I know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, she was a bit before my time, but it was great. Like she, she didn't act like she was famous or anything like that. She just treated us as equals. And, and that's what I think is great about the Bernie campaign is it's, it's every, it's not about rich, poor, famous or not famous. We're just all kind of on the same level. Yeah. That's so cool that she did that. And shout out to her because I, uh, I see her, um, liking Kyle's tweets and, and oh, supportive yeah. of him. And the fact that she's, you know, one of the celebrities that like will champion Bernie Sanders, you know, because there's other celebrities out there like, you know, 
and I don't want to knock them too hard, but like John Legend or like all these other people who, you know, fight for Elizabeth Warren, who, you know, is a great candidate also. She has some flaws. Yep. Um, but Definitely probably the second best behind Bernie, definitely. at least the most viable ones. Yes. Yeah. Um, but what I was going to say is a lot of celebrities, you know, they live in this, you know, comfortability of like, you know, they can advocate for someone, but they, at, at the end of the day, they're going to be fine. They have enough money. Yeah. Um, they they don't have to worry about their kids and their grandkids because they're they're cushy enough. They've they've made a career for themselves, um, and that's a, something I really appreciated about Justin Jackson. As I asked him, I was like, "Hey man, I'm sure we're in different different tax brackets, but why are you championing for Bernie Sanders so much?" So shout out to Susan Sarandon because it sort of puts a little bit of like a stamp of approval of what you're doing um, at Ohio University and gives you some validity uh, when you have someone backing you like that. So. For anybody else listening, you know, maybe Justin listens or something like that and shouts you out and or whatever. Um, what 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 is like the goal of what you guys are doing? Are you going around campus? Are you trying to get people to vote for Bernie? Like, uh, what what's your ultimate goal? How many people are involved? Yeah. So currently, we're. I mean, there's over 200 people on our mailing list, but we probably have about between 10 to 20 people that actually come to our weekly meetings. Um, obviously like a lot of people want to get involved, but with classes and, and, you know, extracurricular activities, it's, it's hard to find people that have the time, especially in the winter when it's cold and people don't want to walk to our meetings at nighttime. But basically the main things we've been doing right now, first things first is phone banking. So we've been calling, you know, basically whatever the website has us call, whether it's California, Nevada, Iowa, New Hampshire, one of the early States. And, uh, you know, just calling voters, having conversations with them about why we support Bernie. And the other thing we do is Campus Canvas, uh, and that's basically we use an app actually on our phones, and we oh, don't stop. say app on phones, man. That's a that's a bad word against Bernie people. <laughs> <Get> <laughs> um, but you know we use that, and we 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 kind of just stop kids walking on campus, and and we we initiate conversations about Bernie. And, you know, it's it's a pretty liberal campus. Uh, we're in we're in southeast Ohio, which is a very remote area. We're like the only pop, one of the only population centers, probably along with Marietta, that's in southeastern Ohio. And um, it, it's really an area of the country. We're, we're like very close to West Virginia. And it's an area that's very kind of forgotten about. Uh, and, you know, that's like West Virginia, all 55 counties went to Bernie in 2016 in the primary, and then all of them went to Trump in the general. So we're really trying to get out the message kind of here in the Appalachia area uh, of, you know, why why Bernie can really help those people. And in fact, you know, Joe Burrow is actually from Athens. Oh, nice. Uh, he grew up here. And when he gave his speech about poverty in southeastern Ohio, Athens is the, is the town he was talking about. Wow. So we're just trying to initiate that kind of stuff. And then our ultimate goal, I mean, is obviously to help Bernie win Ohio come the primary. And uh, we'd like, we're trying to have a rally on campus. So I've reached out to the campaign. We're trying to get Bernie down here. If not, you know, Susan or AOC or someone like that, but we're still kind of in the early phases of planning that. So that's something that we're, we just don't have the initial details on. Cause I don't think the campaign is planning offense that far ahead. Cause they're trying to focus on the early stage right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you know, hopefully Kyle listens to this cause I know he's, he knows some people within the campaign and it you yeah. know, sounds like you guys are doing great things. Um, and to get ahead of it, it would be a good idea for someone to reach out to you because I mean, I'm sure it's a huge campus. I'm sure you've got a gymnasium. I'm sure you've got facilities that they can use. Um, What's some of the feedback that you get from people? Like, for example, when you called Iowa, how, how are people receptive to Bernie? Do they hang up the phone? Because I give you a lot of credit, man. It's not easy to pick up the phone and talk to people. Um, and I don't know if you've actually knocked on doors. I haven't. But um, what, what what's the feedback you've gotten from people? Yeah, it's, it's definitely like harder to actually initiate one on one conversations than to give speeches. I spoke at a Bernie rally in Charleston, West Virginia in like 2018. And there were probably 2,000 people I was talking to, and that that's easier than one-on-one -on -one conversation because, like, who's you? Everyone else is going to drown them out. But if it's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, it, it's a real mix. More people, more often than not, like, even if people don't support Bernie, they're still going to be kind. They're like, hey, I'm supporting so-and-so. Even if they're supporting Trump, usually they're like, hey, I'm a Trump supporter, oh, wow. but, you know, thank you for calling. Most people are generally nice. Every once in a while, you get people that are like, you know, like, don't call me, go the hell away, that type of stuff. But usually that's not the case. And we we have a couple examples of we've actually like talked people into supporting Bernie. Nice. Because what we try to do, and this is what's great about Bernie, is just keep it centered on the issues. Medicare for all, living wage, ending the interventionist regime, regime change wars. And when you really keep it to the issues, people say this, directs, this effect directly affects me. And that's what draws people to Bernie because when you have people like Pete Buttigieg getting up there saying all these things like 
you know, our democracy is centered around our values. Well, that sounds nice, but that could mean anything. Yeah. I mean, what what does that mean? And Bernie says, like, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to fix the country. And that's what pe- people are sick and tired of hearing, like, I'm going to fix the problems. They want to hear, how am I going to fix problems? What exactly am I going to do? Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, Where... Where are you gathering your information from? Because obviously we know that CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, like uh, originally we thought it was just Fox News, but now we see, you know, with yeah. Bernie, and I don't want this to be just a, a like a Bernie celebration conversation, but, you know, it's hard n- not to make it these conversations on Twitter or in yeah. the real life because <laughs> it does, it's just so obvious to see how biased the media right. is um, against Bernie Sanders. So like how... How are you gathering your information? How um, are you relaying that information to people when they're combative with their own facts um, mm-hmm. and not being you know, too confrontational with like, hey, that might not be a right fact there, but this is the actual fact. How are you doing that? Yeah. So honestly, Kyle's kind of the biggest source of news for me. I've actually been watching him since probably 2013. And uh, I, I'm from Pittsburgh, and so it's about three and a half hours from where I go to school. And most of the drives going home for the weekends and stuff is listening to Kyle and Corn podcasts for the last couple of nice. years. So, like, I've listened to you for hours in in my car over the last couple of years. Um, I'm sure but, our uh, conversations like, don't help you too well when you're on the phone with somebody, but hopefully Kyle yeah, sure exactly. does. Yeah, exactly. So it's like half music, half half you and Kyle. But, you know, one thing I, I try to do is, like, you know, I, I think even Kyle would understand, like, it's real easy as Bernie people to, like, kind of get in like a bubble of just hearing other Bernie people and you don't want it to become too much of like a positive feedback loop where we're just kind of like group thinking a little bit. So I try to listen to the establishment media, but the problem is they're so biased against Bernie that you know that what they're saying is bullshit. So like you just, it's really, really hard to listen to them. So I I try to, I've tried to start listening to some of the uh, different progressive channels on YouTube. I I really like Crystal Ball now. I think she's been fantastic yeah. recently. Her and um, what's his name? Uh, Sager Sager. Yeah, I, I don't even know his last name. His is worse <laughs> than mine. But um, you know him and like Rational National. Uh, there's a couple other ones. Um, of course, the Young Turks with Chank mm-hmm. and Anna. Um, so they're all great. And then you know I I do try to try to hear stuff from different perspectives. It's just really hard for me to do that because I see the bias right up front and I know it's so bad. So I, I'd say in terms of like establishment media, I, I listen to BBC World Service a lot and I, I read their news. I think because they have a foreign perspective, they're not quite as biased against Bernie, mm-hmm. more of a new, neutral source. Yeah. So they're really good for like, they're really good for world news because I think it's important that we pay attention to issues in other countries too, even if it doesn't affect us as much directly. That's one thing, you know, I wish our candidates in general would talk about is is how the U.S. can kind of become a beacon of inspiration and hope for the world and not through the force of military but through the force of economic trade and all that kind of stuff 100 percent, yeah and that's what you know bernie preaches is just just like we can have conversations with these dictators and hopefully you know they'll come around with you know like we all have to agree that global warming is a is a bad issue so like let's put the guns down and just agree that you know if we don't stop this (laughs) we're all going to die regardless of what gun you have or what gun you have or what rocket you have um What's your yeah? And, and global warming is an issue where like it could really get the superpowers of the world who hate each other to really come together in the same way that when the Nazis were doing the Holocaust and all the horrible things they did, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, arch enemies, came together to fight that common enemy. If we treat climate change as the same way, I think the U.S., the the, the Russians, and the Middle Eastern nations could all kind of come together to fight a common enemy against humanity. I think it could be a great unifying issue of the world if we didn't let the oil companies buy out our politicians. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what it is. Ultimately, is big corporations like telling mm-hmm. us that global warming isn't an issue. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, um, and that it's not something to worry about. But when you have, you know, candidates like, you know, Bernie or Elizabeth Warren fighting for these issues of global warming um, and just seeing from watching the news that all of this stuff has been going on around the world that, you know, it's affecting us right now, and we really have to take mm-hmm. a stab at, um, yeah, at, at at you know, like bettering it. So, um, I wanted to ask you what your uh, what, what's your nationality? What's your background? Yeah. So, well, if, if you don't mind me asking, what looking at me, what do you what do you think? I don't want to say. So, uh, um, <laughs> um, I don't like I don't know Peruvian or something like that. I don't know. That's funny. I I literally get everything from all sorts of people. So my my mom is like almost completely Polish. Okay. Uh, there's also a little bit of 
Slovak, uh, other Eastern European stuff in there. We're not exactly, I mean, the borders have changed so many times. We're not exactly sure. I know that like my grandparents, my, my grandpa's parents spoke Polish and my, my grandma came from like a hundred percent or my, they spoke Slovak and my grandma came from like a hundred percent Polish, uh, speaking. And then my, my dad's side is more complicated. He's half Italian. That's where, Oh yeah. I should have put the two and two together with your last name. Yeah. And the rest of his stuff is, it's a whole mosh pit of stuff from all over Europe. Uh, like just a, a tad of native American there, I think as well. So yeah, most people think that most people actually don't think that I'm white when they, when they see me. Yeah. And as far as I know, I've never done like the DNA test or anything, but as far as I know, I'm, it, it's all European with just a smidge of like native American in there. But uh, unlike Elizabeth Warren, I'm not going to write down that on my college, <laughs> college entrance because it's like this much of a smidgen. Probably a so. little bit more than her, but so you can get you get probably, away with it. Probably, yeah. <laughs> um, how, how did you get involved with politics and what made you sort of want to start listening to Kyle and, you know, start? Did, did you start the organization on campus with your two other friends? Um, I did. So, yeah. So when I when I grew up, uh, my family would always go to West Virginia for vacation because it's, it's only a couple hours from Pittsburgh. And we'd go in the mountains and go hiking and fishing and kind of all that outdoor activities. So I fell in love with nature from a very young age mm -hmm. and kind of during the Bush years. And, you know, I one of like the first things I remember in my life was 9-11. I was four and a half years old when 9-11 happened. And so it was kind of like the wake up call to the way the world works. 9-11, Iraq war, all that stuff. Another thing that was a wake up call was the, in, the destruction of the environment. I remember, you know, Al Gore releasing an inconvenient truth. And I realized that like the land I loved in West Virginia was there were people who just didn't give a shit about the environment. Right. So I became really passionate about that. And then as I got older, I, I realized that like, or at least I thought the Democratic Party actually cared and the Republican Party didn't because I'm from like the edge of the suburbs of Pittsburgh, which the city of Pittsburgh is liberal, but the suburbs are very, very, it's white, wealthy yeah. conservatives pretty yeah. much. So I became kind of an outlier at my school, which I kind of had like a bit of a cult following because of it. But I also had a lot of people that just outright hated me because I was very outspokenly left wing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, and now the natural gas drilling fracking is really big in western pennsylvania it's one of the biggest places in the country and there's a couple uh there's a couple wells by our school and um by my high school should i say and so i really was involved with trying to fight those and protest those but it's so much corruption just as it is with any of the corporate democrats or the, especially trump and the republicans the uh woman whose land the one of the fracking wells was built on actually ran for and won uh butler county commissioner in pennsylvania wow. So it's a direct conflict of interest yeah. that this is a political issue that she's building an industrial site on her land in a residential neighborhood. And here she is like in power in the county. So the, it, it was just so much corruption. And that's kind of what got me into politics. And then I went to it was really Bernie in 2016 that made me realize that like the Democrats are the opposite side of the same coin from the Republicans. They're better. They're not racist and hateful, but they're just as bought out to the establishment in a wall street. And I realized that like with Hillary Clinton, that she wasn't going to do anything to actually help the working people of this country, minorities economically in this country. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's great, man. I give you a lot of credit. Um, did you find that a lot of people in your high school are a little bit more politically educated because I'm, I'm 31. So I'm a little bit older than you. Um, when I was in high school, it wasn't even like no one was really politically, you know, talking yeah. <laughs> about things like obviously 9-11. I was uh, in seventh grade, so I don't even know how old I was. Maybe I don't know. I, I'm terrible at thinking back on age. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was something that happened. We didn't really understand too much about what was going on. We knew we were going to war. But then when we got to high school, it still wasn't like we were talking about politics too much until I got to college. And then Obama you know, was running and I started getting a little bit more interested because he was, you know, first back black president. Um, did you find that kids were more politically involved? Cause I would assume, were you in high school when like a lot of these school shootings were happening and stuff like that, that, um, so Sandy Hook happened, I think I was in 10th or 11th grade okay. and that was kind of one of the first big ones. Uh, my, my brother's a junior in high school and he's a big Bernie supporter as well. Nice. Uh, man. So hi Adam, I know you're watching, <laughs> but, um, I, I think he more grew up with that okay. and I more grew up with like, I feel like I more grew up with Bush and the Iraq war and 9-11 and like the first black president being elected. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, kind of why I identify more as a millennial rather than a Gen Z, mm -hmm. uh, because I feel like the events that shaped kind of my vision in the world are closer to probably what you grew up yep. with than what my brother grew up with, even though he's only six years younger than me. Um, but in high school, most people 
it was they were either like far right wing or they just weren't politically involved. I remember people like came up to me and told me in secret that their family voted Democrat because it, in, in our school mock election it was over eighty percent for Donald Trump wow. in twenty sixteen. And and I graduated in 2015, but even in like the 12 and 08 elections, I remember being in, I think, first or second grade in the 04 election. And I didn't know a lot about politics back then, but I remember telling a kid in my class that uh, um, like my family supported John Kerry because we were against the war. And I remember a kid actually telling me, why do you support John Kerry? You know that Democrats eat dogs, right? What? And, and I guess the connection they were trying to make was Democrats are communists and the Chinese were communists and historically people in China ate dogs. I don't know. Well, I mean, it now with the whole something. coronavirus, the kid's not too far off with that, that, that <laughs> yeah. argument. It, it was something obviously that they got fed from from their parents from Fox yeah. News. And most of the kids that did talk politics from my high school were just completely brainwashed with like the right wing kind of BS from Fox News and their parents. I have a lot of friends from my high school that were right-wingers who not not all of them were that way. Some of them were highly intelligent people. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to like lump them all together, obviously. But like as Kyle always says, there's the TFGs, the too far gones. And then there's the people who are a little bit more reasonable and you can kind of, you know, uh, even if you disagree with them, it's more respectable. But overall, I think, and that's kind of one thing I wanted to talk to you about tonight to get the message out is like the biggest problem isn't that all the people voted for Jill Stein in 2016. It's not people who voted for Trump. It's the people who sat home and didn't vote at all. There's so much kind of apathy towards politics and people who just don't get involved at all, especially with young people. Old people over 65 are way more likely to vote than people who are in our age group, 18 to 35. If people our age group actually start giving a damn about politics and getting out there and voting, then the candidates who support our values are going to win. Yeah, that's amazing, man. And, and, you know, I would say before I really started getting involved with Kyle, I I gave a shit about politics. I cared, you know, but it was almost like one of those things where, um, you know, I say this t- to my wife sometimes, too, with, uh, I don't know, other things when I have a plastic straw or something like that. You know, she's yeah. like, you know, why do you have a plastic straw if this or that, you know, with the environment? And I'm like, ah, it's not going to make a difference or something like that. But like, it does. It does make a difference. You know, every single person having that thought like i'm not going to vote because it's corrupt or this or that um again now it 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 it, it's still very hard to even trust your vote counting because i mean like you see this stuff happening in iowa and it 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 worries me because you know uh you know i'll vote in illinois but like you you, i just read today um the person who's in charge of now the, the the nevada like security or whatever. Did you see this? She was like a, a, a Pete Buttigieg employee or yeah. something like that. So it's like, how can you even trust or tell people, you know, if you're not, if you call someone and say, how can I even trust that my vote counts? What would you tell someone? Well, that's why like we need to get out there and not just win by a little bit. We need to absolutely crush the competition. We need to win by 15% to actually win by 5% because we need to give us that buffer zone in case there's more shady stuff that goes on. And, you know, I I don't like to jump to conspiracies and I kind of can't because I'm kind of officially coordinating with Bernie's campaign and Bernie hasn't gone there. But I mean, to be completely frank and honest, if you're not at least somewhat suspicious about what went down in Iowa with all the red flags that there are and all the connections to Pete, you're, you are fooling yourself. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's possible it's just extreme ineptitude and incompetence, which if that's the case, Tom Perez still needs to des- resign because it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. But I don't blame people for getting suspicious that it was something more or that it was right, yeah. especially with all the stuff that went on in 2016 and what we saw in the WikiLeaks emails. Yeah. And I, I just don't understand. I, I don't understand how people don't get a little suspicious. But, you know, my my idea is like we need to take all of our anger with what happened in Iowa, whether it was right or not, and we need to put it towards New Hampshire, put it towards Nevada, and then South Carolina. I know I'm actually probably driving down there uh, two weekends from now to knock on doors nice. in South Carolina. We're going to probably send a group of people if we can find a place to stay and all that. And, uh, and then after that, like, you know, we're really going to work on Ohio and um, all the other future states that come after that. But going off like you being involved in politics when you were younger, what was, did you always vote in every election? What was the first time you actually voted? Um, I think the first election I voted in was for Obama um, when I was in college. Okay. Uh, that was the first one. Yeah. And then I voted for Hillary. Um, and now I'm starting to get a little bit more involved with voting for like governor and all the, you know, local yeah. elections um, because that stuff matters maybe yes. even more so than the, you know, like it directly mm-hmm. affects me here in where I live, you know, so All politics are local. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So in my hometown, there's actually a guy named uh, Daryl Metcalf. You can look him up. He's our state. He was my state representative. Is he a former athlete? 
Oh, no, okay. uh, he is worse than Donald Trump. Oh. And there's a guy named Brian Sims from Philadelphia who was the first openly gay congressperson in the state house in Pennsylvania. Uh, the first time he gave up, went up to give a speech, Metcalf started screaming and tried to not let him speak because he's so homophobic and he didn't want him to have the equality of being a politician that everyone should deserve. So there's there's a guy named Daniel Smith Jr. that's actually running, and I'm not re- I'm registered in Ohio now because I, I live here, but uh, I'll I'll definitely be going back home over spring break and knocking on doors for Daniel because. He's he's significant. Obviously, I mean, it doesn't say much to say he's better than Metcalf, but he is. I mean, he, he's he's more liberal and he's more accepting. And, you know, it, all politics are local, especially like when you talk about issues like I mentioned with the fracking, even like the county commissioners having conflict of interest and in that kind of stuff. The local races really matter. Yeah. But to, to kind of the point I want to make asking you that question mm-hmm. was. What I would say to everyone who says, you know, I don't want to get involved in politics like like you are running a Bernie group or like Kyle is with his TV show or anyone. I just say to people like what I think you should make your goal is to get informed on all the races happening and just to show up and vote. That doesn't it takes a couple hours of research one day, two days going to the polls every year because of the primaries. That's all you have to do. You don't have to. I mean, knock on doors and stuff is great. I hope you do that. But if everyone could just commit themselves to voting at the bare minimum, I think that would more than be enough to fix our problems. I will say, um, and that, and that's a great point. Everyone should get out to vote, it, it, whether you you know whether you're a Bernie Span- Sanders supporter or not. You support Donald Trump. Just get out and vote. Get out and vote. Don't vote for Donald Trump, but like get out there and vote. Um, yeah. <laughs> I will say, I think a deterrent I had to voting when I was younger was just the like figuring out what even to do to register to um yes. find out i think even when i was in illinois for for when i voted for hillary clinton um was just to find out if i was even registered to vote so like yeah it's com- like it feels like it's complicated when it shouldn't be it should almost just be like if you have a driver's license you should be able to show up show your driver's license and vote and that's one of the reasons why some of these candidates win because voter suppression it's difficult to vote you you can't take a day off from work so it, it, how would you yeah. explain uh, do you know the process of what you got to do to maybe vote if you're not registered? So the thing is, it really depends on every state. So here in Ohio, we have open primaries. So no matter what you registered, you just pick your party the day that you go vote. You vote in that primary. Where I'm from, Pennsylvania, I, I, I think their deadline might even be this week. Wow. You have to be registered as a Democrat to vote in the primary for the Democrat. So like when I was registered in PA, I registered as a Democrat just so I could vote for Bernie in the 2016 primary. And then it's complicated because, like, I was living in Ohio, but I feel and I voted back in Pennsylvania because I still, you know, was registered at my parents' address, mm-hmm. and I wasn't I wasn't registered in Ohio. I forgot to fill out my absentee ballot for the general election because I voted for Hillary then, and because you know there's this myth that all us Bernie people voted for Jill Stein yeah. or didn't vote. No, I, I not only did I vote for Hillary, I drove three and a half hours to Pittsburgh on a Tuesday night to vote for Hillary. She loses, and I had to drive back to Ohio the very next day. So all that all that commitment for right. nothing, but um. I I think what we need to do is voting needs to be on a federal holiday first off because you look at especially blue collar workers they can't really take the day off to go vote or especially caucus the fact that we have caucuses is ridiculous it should be on a federal holiday so everyone has the time to go vote and everyone I think let's just connect being registered to vote to getting a driver's license because that pretty much everyone has the driver's license you can fill out do you want to be an organ donor when you get your driver's license why don't they say can we register you to vote as well. Yeah. I think that's the perfect way to do it. And then people who, you know, I understand there's some people who like they may have disability to where they can't get a driver's license. Well, then we should have automatic voter registration for those people, too, or an easy way for, you know, those who might have a disability or something who can't have a driver's license so they can vote in some other sort of way. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it just seems like common sense or it's just like if you're a U.S. citizen, you should almost be registered to vote like yes. as is. There shouldn't be any like obviously you know, if you went to prison, there should be some rules or something. Maybe you got to fill something out. But like, if you're just a regular old citizen, you should just be able to show up and vote. There should be no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Even if you went to prison and you're now out of prison, because if you get sentenced to 10 years for something like that, the idea is once you've served your 10 years, you're now out as a free person. So this idea that like a former felon can't register to vote is hogwash to me. I mean, I, I think when people get out of prison in general, we should tabula rosa gives a clean slate and we got to give them a fresh start and yeah I, it's just i i think part of it is just bad management in terms of the voter registration system but i think part of it is definitely like vo- uh, voter suppression and you know they know that the demographic of not only minorities but also just you know poor white working class and poor working class people in general 
uh, you know, those are the people who are going to vote for anti-establishment candidates, and that's why the establishment politicians will vote for them. And kind of on a, on a tangent to that, I think that's something that I think Bernie's doing a lot better in 2020 than 2016. I've said for a long time, if we can convince poor black people and poor white people that they're actually allies with each other and their common enemy is the establishment rather than they should hate each other, that's the way that we win. People like Trump like to divide poor white people and poor black people and say to the poor white people, it's the black people and the Muslims and the Mexicans are your problem. Yep. That's not your problem. You guys are you guys face a common enemy and, and the working people of this country should come together regardless of their race or their gender or whatever. Yeah, that's uh, you make a great point, man. Um, I, what you said, your parents were John Kerry supporters. Um, I I don't know. Maybe did they support Hillary Clinton? No, they were both big Bernie. Supporters oh, nice. So what uh, they seem pretty reasonable. Did you have to can do any convincing with them like or did they educate themselves? I don't know how much of it came from me. I mean, I know I definitely talked to them a lot about Bernie, yeah. but I, I think they both supported Bernie for the main reason that I did, and that's that Bernie's just not taking money from the establishment. Bernie's the candidate that actually is going to stand for the regular people. And I, I, my parents weren't necessarily political growing up. I I, 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 I've, I know they didn't want to like kind of brainwash me to just you know believe exactly what they did or anything like that. So I, I didn't Except for like maybe talking about the Iraq war and the environment, I didn't really hear a lot of political talk at home. Now that I'm older, I talk to my parents all the time about politics. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I know like my mom was registered Republican a lot of her life, but she pretty much always voted Democrat. And it was actually Bernie in 2016 where she actually switched her party registration over so she could vote in the primary in Pennsylvania. Nice. And I think my dad was independent until 08 when he switched to Democrat to vote for Obama in the Pennsylvania primary. But I'm pretty sure they've both always voted Democrat, at least since like the Bill Clinton days. So, I, I mean, it, there definitely is a correlation with I, I, even though my parents didn't really give me their political views on purpose, they I was definitely raised with like the values of basically being a kind person and treating everyone else equally. Yeah. And, and that was kind of hard growing up, growing up like in a wealthy neighborhood, in a wealthy family. Most of my friends, like my school district was kind of divided into two townships. One was very wealthy and one was more working class or middle class. Mm -hmm. And most of my friends were from the middle class side of town. And they'd come over to, I, I actually remember my, my, like one of my best friends from high school, his, his cousin visited from Arizona they dropped me off at my house afterwards because his cousin was older and he, he had a, his license at the time. And, and I remember him pulling into the driveway and being like, oh, I had no idea you were a rich kid. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm just not a snob like a lot of my neighbors are. And, and of course, I mean, how did your friendship progress after that? Because I know a lot of times if someone finds something out about you or so, I mean, like, not that that's a bad thing that your family may have yeah. some money, but like, was everything closer? I'm still really good friends with my friend, um, the, the kid who said it was his cousin and he lives in Arizona. So I never I never saw him oh. or talked to him again. But um, yeah, it was it was just tough because, you know, kids like were so focused on kind of just fitting in and being popular. And, and even in certain neighborhoods, like, you know, like what sometimes what street you live on determines like your social value within the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. If you live on the main street, it's your higher value than on a side street. Yeah. I mean, you see and, that. And that's you, so stupid. Yeah, no, it's dumb. But I mean, that's unfortunately how a lot of things work. You know, I say this with my brother all the time, just joking around. Um, or I used to say this when I worked at Madison Square Garden was like, you know, because I wore a suit to work every every night, every game. Yeah. I could walk anywhere in that building because, you know, I'm walking with a yeah. suit. I'm walking with confidence because I had been there for four years. Yes. And mm -hmm. you can get pretty much anywhere in the building and talk to anybody that you want. If you have confidence, you're dressed nicely yep. and you're put together. <laughs> Whereas, you know, if it's unfortunate, but the smartest guy in the room is wearing some sweatpants and walking around, he's going to get stopped. He's going to get hassled and, you know, he's going to be given a hard time. And you see that in our society today too, which is sad because we don't give people – a chance, you know, like I'm sure maybe I should have took my beanie off before we started talking because maybe some people will look at this and be like, oh, that kid with the hat doesn't seem like he knows what he's talking about. And well, at least you don't have Kyle's goofy half backwards <laughs> hat on it. Kyle's going to watch this, man. He's going to get mad at you. <laughs> he's going to watch this. You're stuck in 2002. <laughs> um, I respect that Kyle doesn't waver on, you know, his what he feels. We went to Joe Rogan's and he had yeah. he still had a phone clip on his on his waist and like phone clips are. <laughs> 88 man like no one's rocking well, a phone fanny company. packs are coming back with college kids now yeah fanny so. packs are one because it's sort of trending you go to, like, like the parties all the girls are wearing fanny yes packs now, fanny packs so. are popular they're coming back um but like the phone clips are not it's not something you see anymore people keep their phone in their back pocket like it, it's not it's yeah. i don't see it as trendy as cool and I'll, I'll tell kyle that but like he will say <laughs> that like 
he w- he will keep wearing something if he feels that like there's a use for it. like he actually likes that he could just go to his belt clip and pull off his phone so like yeah he wore his hat like that because like maybe it was comfortable there that was just how he threw it on his head and he didn't want to move it so yeah. i will give him the benefit of the doubt just that like he's not doing it because he thinks it's cool or not cool he's doing it because that's just what happened but that's that's what's i think why people like new media in general compared to the establishment people on media because they're always so and, you know, I'm kind of in the middle on this. I mean, I, I try to, like, present myself nicely and dress nice. Like, I, I changed into a proper Appreciate shirt it. for this interview. I had my I LSU Champions t-shirt on earlier today. <laughs> but <laughs> but but at the same time, I think it's why people like Bernie, too. And, and it's also why people like Trump. It's about authenticity and confidence. And, like, it, you might wear something that's goofy or silly, but, like, that's real. That's just who you're being. And if you and if you're gonna be like a, a perfectly groomed 1950s politician, which is who, if you think about like Marco Rubio or Pete Buttigieg or someone you like that, Romney, man. people nowadays see that and be like, "You're a fake. Yeah. You're not even real." So Bernie Sanders usually has about the worst hair on stage yeah. of anyone I've ever yeah. seen. It looks awful, yeah. but that's why people like him because he's being authentic. And and I think I'm glad that our society and the younger generations are not worried about that all that old stuff so much. Yeah. That, people yeah. like people flipping out about things like someone. I remember even just twenty years ago, if someone just said a basic cuss word on television, people would. It was like the end of the world if someone said, "Oh damn." Yeah. Well, nowadays that's not even like a swear word anymore. Yeah. It's just a word. You no, know? it's a great point. And I, and I went to a Bernie rally when he was here in uh, in Chicago. And yeah. to your point, man, it was like. Everyone was there. It was black. It was white. It was a person yeah. with blue hair. It was people with the big earlobe earrings. It was tattoos. It was, uh, it was everybody. And and it was so awesome because everyone was so welcoming. They were so cool. And like, it, there was huge lines. And it was took time to get into the venue because they were setting up. And like, no one was like, "Come on, man, what the fuck? Like, this is taking forever." Like, people were just chilling online. Whereas like, yeah, and not to you know, I don't. I love how you say online. I can always tell you're a New Yorker when you say that. Sometimes it's, in the Midwest we say inline. No, it's online. <laughs> have, you, have you started calling it pop since you moved to no, Illinois? No, I don't. I'm not adjusting to anything. The pizza's good, but okay. New York pizza is still the way to go. I will put then, that on record. In, in Pittsburgh, we're very passionate that it's pop and not soda. Never, like. <laughs> never, never, never. Um, but to my point, I went to um a Knicks Bucks game in Milwaukee, and right mm-hmm. next door from the arena, they were having a Trump rally, and yeah. I left the basketball game a little bit early. The Knicks got creamed, so like the you know the Trump rally was letting out at the same time, and I saw on the corner the people that were at the rally, and it was literally it looked like if you see any of these memes of like these you know these white girls in college that wear like the same um, these spandex pants and uh, yeah like maybe you know all different ethnicity girls wear these spandex pants or whatever, but like the Trump supporters they all had like a leather jacket on and they had yeah. like these jeans and they had their hat. They just looked like all the same person. And that's literally yeah. what I see in every Trump person, whether it's online or on Twitter. Um, you look at someone's avatar and you meet him in person. It's the same person. The woman is just like a, a yelling lady. Um, and, and, and I don't want to stereotype, but it's every person that I've seen. They, they're just all the same person. Whereas if you have an argument yeah. with a Bernie person, it's going to be a person from any which part of the country. Yeah, every – like you go to these Trump rallies and it's a bunch of Karens. Yeah. Married yeah. to a bunch of make me a sandwich type yes. guys, like, and it it, it it it's so. I think unoriginality is a big thing in general, especially on college campuses. Mm-hmm. And I don't I don't go to a city school, so I think it's even even worse here with being in a small town. And I, I know sometimes that I'll because I'm I'm single. Sometimes I'll I'll be I'll be looking at girls. I'd be like, they're all wearing the same, same thing. I, I want someone who's gonna like spy, like wear something interesting. Yeah. You yeah. know, I wanna I want something interesting. That's why I try to be a little unique myself because most of the guys wear the same stuff too if you actually pay attention to them and it's just like it's such a homogenous culture sometimes mm-hmm. which i mean it's good to a point because you don't want to be like too you don't want to be too weird you i think i think it was carl sagan who said you don't want to be so open mind that your brain falls yeah. out but you want to be open-minded and, and unique enough to where if you're just being like everybody else like it just makes you boring yeah. and it doesn't make you interesting and 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 they're like what makes you you if you're just gonna dress like everyone else and act like everyone else and go to starbucks and drink the same caramel macchiato as everybody else yeah. i mean i'm not knocking that if that's your thing that's your thing yeah. but if you're doing it to be like everyone else then you're just a boring person yeah no it's a great reason man and like it even gets it even i don't keep kosher but you know i've got a buddy 
I, I've got friends who uh, I actually went to um, like uh, I'm I'm an or not an Orthodox Jew. I'm a Reformed Jew, um, but yeah. I. Um, I, I believe in God, but I, I'm sort of like a little bit of an atheist too. I don't know. I think religion is sometimes a little bit phony, but I, I do think um, that just being a good person overall is just an outlook that we should have on life. And Judaism, yeah. you know, preaches that. Um, and we had a, a really reformed rabbi when we went to a temple here out in Illinois, and he was um, a rabbi at an Orthodox um, temple in Miami before he came out here. And you know, he said he would get up on stage and he would see all these people in the audience that, you know, were pretending to be all good because they were at Temple. But he saw them when they left and, you know, they got in the Mercedes or the husband was yelling at their wife. And it was just it was just fake. He didn't believe it. Um, so he became a reformed uh, rabbi. Yeah. And that's that's to your point. Like if you're going to Starbucks because everybody else is going to Starbucks, like to me, you're phony and you're not living your real life. Like, yeah, go to wherever dunkin donuts or try a different coffee shop so like i sometimes laugh at my or support a small business or support a, a small business yeah so like i'll yeah. laugh at my brother sometimes because when we're on a road trip um in montreal we go um a good amount he'll like seek out these unique boutique I'm, I'm going up there next june i've never been oh before. you're gonna have a great time it's it's beautiful yeah. the food is great the people are friendly um it's it's a it's a great time there's nice bars uh so you know dm me i'll tell you a couple spots um yeah to, to check out but, you know, I give him some grief sometimes because he, you know, seeks out these little boutique coffee shops. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, let's just hit Dunkin' Donuts. But he loves his coffee. He's He's been to Columbia. He's been to DR. And he really appreciates a good coffee. And I love well, that about I, I, him. I, I, I'm probably just as bad about that because I, I have some family in Seattle. So I'm out in Seattle all the so time. You know. it, 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 Seattle's my favorite place. Yeah. Like, I, I want to end up there someday. And, um in in Seattle, like we have we have a couple local coffee shops in Athens. I mean, we're a pretty small town, so there's not a ton that are really really good. But even like the best coffee shop in Athens, if you're if you're anywhere in Seattle, any neighborhood, even in like the suburbs, you walk into any local coffee shop, it's as good as anything I've been to in Ohio. Sure. And I went to Toronto with my sister over Christmas break for a couple of days, and we tried I tried to find some coffee shops. Everywhere we went into was a chain, and some of them were pretty good, <laughs> but it, it just had nothing on the game in no. Seattle. And it makes me realize, like, different regions of the country really value – like, you go in any place in New York, you're going to get a bang and slice of yeah, pizza. Yep. You go to Seattle, there's no good pizza yeah. in Seattle. You you can go to a fish place and get a killer piece of salmon in Seattle, and you go to a fancy fish place in Toronto, and they won't even have wild salmon. It'll just be farm raised, yeah. which, like, to, to someone who spent a lot of time in Seattle, it's like, that's a sin to have farm raised salmon. Uh, I I lived in Alaska this summer and uh, I had an internship up there nice. in like a, a rural fishing village mm -hmm. and it made me even more entrenched into the, the salmon culture. Which talk about climate change? I mean, it really affected it up there in Alaska. I'm sure. But anyway, I got off track a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, no, no. I think that's great, man. And and it just goes to show that like people know their like territories a little bit better than you might. So like not thinking you know everything, you know, like so like. Yeah. Someone goes to New York, they might ask me some advice for something going on there, like a politician, you know, yeah. he doesn't know it. Like Bernie doesn't know everything, but he relies on the people in West Virginia. He relies on the people yes. everywhere in California to tell him what's going on in his regions, in those areas, in those states. And he trusts them, you know, and he listens to the people, whereas yeah. other people just have these um, their idea. And this is what we're going to do. And this is and it's just like they don't connect to people. What do you say to people that say that Bernie is like? strong-minded like that where sometimes he can come across as like it's my way or the highway type of deal well I, I i draw comparisons to history and i say the ones who always make history happen are the ones who were strong-minded and and this is something I, i've been tweeting a lot about recently you know people say like bernie's ideas are like he's aiming for the moon <laughs> and it's too high well john f kennedy literally aimed for the moon <laughs> And people said, you're crazy. We're not going to do it. And JFK said, I, I can't mock a Boston accent, but he said, we don't do it because it's easy. We do it because it's hot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and guess what? We freaking went to the moon, 1969, like he said we were going to mm -hmm. do. FDR with the New Deal. And I mean, I mean, look at it in a historical context. Bernie is saying something so much less than things we've done in the past. Imagine when we tried to get rid of slavery. We fought a war to get rid of slavery. Imagine if most of the liberals at the time, it was the Republicans, would have been like, Lincoln, you're being ridiculous. Yeah. Let's be realistic. Yeah. Maybe we'll only stop new states from having slaves. Yeah. No, sla and, and obvious, and like, if we got rid of slavery, if we gave women the right to vote, if we had the civil rights movement, we literally put a man on the moon, those things are way, way bigger and way more grave. Well, climate change is equally as grave, but 
like Bernie's most of his proposals are not half as big as yeah. those things. And and it's like, well, I don't get why so many people are so against it. Like it's not like he's yeah. he's advocating for these things that are terrible. Like you you're right. We're shooting for the moon. If we if we land in the stars, like it's a better place than where we're at. Like look at where yes. we are with his campaign as it is. You know, he's shifted the yeah. conversation so far to something we've never seen before with, you know, corruption yeah. and and money in politics and even now the DNC getting exposed for being corrupt and it's just like <laughs> Yeah. He's the one that healthcare. He started all of these conversations that without him being crazy Bernie and like saying all this yeah. stuff that sounded so outlandish at first, now is normal. Now you have candidates he, that he are corrupt the talking about it. Window to make those ideas seem more realistic. Absolutely. And if you go to any other country, Canada or Sweden or Denmark, Bernie's just like a standard center, maybe center left politician in those countries. Yeah. Bernie's only so far left. To us, because America is so far right yeah. politically. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's great, man. So, talk about. Uh, I want to talk about what you're doing on campus a little bit more. And so, yep. are are you technically like affiliated with Bernie? Like, do, is there someone in his campaign that like maybe gives you some talking points to talk about or whatnot? Yeah. So, uh, one of the guys who helped me co-found it, Nick. Uh, he is called. A, he's actually what's called a campus core leader, and he, he was trained by the Bernie campaign to basically be the canvasser on campus for Ohio University. Okay. Um, and I think of all of the student groups among. This was as of like November, so kind of outdated info. But out of like 2,000 college student groups for Bernie, I think we were number 31 for most students canvas. So we were definitely one of the higher up ones. Nice. Um, and. Basically, um, we're 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 kind of officially affiliated. It's kind of it's it's kind of vague on how that works a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but we do have contacts that are directly in the Bernie campaign. Um, I, I won't name names because I'm yeah, not sure if I can. And thing. they're not people that are. It's not like Nina Turner yeah, level. Yeah. It's it's people who you want to know who they are. But um, and obviously they have contacts that are higher mm -hmm. up. So again, what we're, they've pretty much told us like it's up to us to lay the groundwork at this point. And I think what hap if I think the first four states are going to go really well. And after that point, I think Bernie's going to open a campaign office in Columbus, which is the capital of Ohio, and it's only an hour from Athens. So I think once that happens, that's really going to help us because they can send a lot of resources to us and. And then obviously, ultimately, as I said, like having a big rally on my campus right after spring break comes back, which is like three days before our primary, that that would be the ultimate thing. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be able to introduce Bernie or AOC or whoever comes down yeah. to speak. That would be amazing. Um, yeah. I, I, like I said, I, I know Kyle will, will watch this and um, – yeah. He knows, yeah, he knows some people you there. Yeah, and Kyle are more than welcome to if you're if you're passing by Ohio, let me know. For sure, yeah, I, I drive through Ohio when I go back to New York. Um, so yeah, so I um yeah, I mean, I I would love if ultimately Bernie did go there to you know you know just be there um and and just yeah. and just see you, someone I had spoken to, introducing him would be totally yeah. awesome. Um, what are you guys talking about weekly in in your meetings? So most of our meetings are actually, it's pretty business-like where we're actually going over like, this is what we're doing the next week. You know, Friday's the campus canvas. Thursday night's going to be the phone bank. Uh, on, on Sundays, we've just started like we're doing little study sessions at one of our local coffee shops nice. together. I, I actually was at that before I, before I came back to talk to you. Um, kind of just we go through the events. And then if we have time, we'll just kind of have a general chat. And we'll kind of just like usually voice our frustrations with the DNC and basically the stuff that's been going on. And of course, we talk about other like political issues and stuff like that, too. But we're not really we don't really talk politics a lot. We're, we're really here to actually work for Bernie and to like put the work in to Canvas, to phone bank. And that, that's kind of the center of what we're doing. I'd love to have the time to like more talk politics and have discussions with other groups on campus. But the Ohio primary is it's February 9th right now so it's march 17th is primary so it's like barely over a month away we don't really have time to set up those kind of events where like it's go time at this point and last semester we kind of screwed around a little bit more but now we really got to get to work yeah no that's awesome man and and you're on the ground in ohio granted you're you said you're in a small town athens or yeah. um what can you get a feel because ohio is a swing state correct Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you get? Do you have any sense or feeling of what the vibe is like in Ohio? Are people coming around to Bernie? Uh, I think Bernie will definitely have a great <clears throat> chance of beating Trump in Ohio. I think he probably would. <clears throat> I, I'm positive he would in Pennsylvania uh, because Western Pennsylvania, where I'm from, has was historically very Democrat until the last 20 years when the Democrats abandoned the working class, and then and then the whole Pittsburgh area, which was you know a very kind of Rust Belt all. Uh, 
it's not technically in the Midwest, but it's it's very similar yeah, yeah, yeah. to the Midwest. So, you know, where you live is very similar. Um, and, 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 you know, Ohio is kind of the same way. Um, obviously, it, it kind of depends on what part of the state you're in, because, you know, we're, I'm in the poorest part of Ohio. We're right along the West Virginia border. So it's very it's actually very mountainous around okay. here, which is definitely different than the Ohio that you drive yeah. through. You're probably on 90 or 80 up, up yeah, north. Yeah, I go through, you know, we're Toledo, down Cleveland. Yeah, totally different down mm-hmm. here. It's a lot it's a lot less industrial and a lot more just mountainous. And like, we have a lot of coal mining history and stuff, just like, just like Pittsburgh does. It's very similar. So I I would say like the part of Ohio I live in is if you look at the locals, it's almost more like West Virginia than it is like the rest of Ohio. Ohio and West Virginia are similar States anyway, but my campus is an interesting place because we're an Appalachian town with a bunch of students from everyone that goes to my school is basically from the three C's Columbus, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. That's in some from Chicago. That's pretty much my entire school. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a weird mosh pit of people. And how many but kids are there people, on campus? Um, I know my graduating class is like forty eight hundred. Oh, okay. So if you multiply it by four, it's probably like twenty thousand undergrads, oh, okay. and then maybe school. three or four thousand graduate students. Mm-hmm. We're one of the bigger campuses in 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 the state. We're we're not Ohio State Buckeyes. Everyone always gets us yeah, confused. Yeah. You guys, that's, your, your logo is green, right? What your logo is green? They all, yes, we yeah, are. Yeah, I remember yeah. seeing them. Yeah, I appreciate you actually knowing that because most people don't know yeah. it. So. Yeah, no, I, I <clears throat> that, that's a pretty big size school. Are, are there other? Do you get involved with other um, universities or colleges that have a, a Bernie um, organization? Uh, we haven't done a ton. There's not really a ton of like huge groups in Ohio per se. I actually reached out to one of the students from the Harvard for Bernie because they're they're real big on Twitter yeah. and, and and they're great. So I followed them. We follow like the Yale students for Bernie. Uh, my sister goes to Penn State, so when I was out there, I actually coincidentally ran across them tabling out on nice. campus. So I kind of introduced myself to them. And Pennsylvania primary is a month after Ohio, so like I might reach out to them and see if they want to do some events together in Pittsburgh or could meet in the middle, something like that. Um, and then I know there's like a WVU students for Bernie. I haven't really reached out to them, but West Virginia is also a month after Ohio. So that's definitely something we might want to do in the future is reach out to other students for Bernie groups. But right now, like this is, we're kind of, I mean, I don't want to say that we're the biggest part of Bernie's campaign in the state because there might be other campuses that I don't know about. So I don't want to false information here, but I think we're probably the biggest part of Bernie's campaign um, among young people in the state of Ohio right now. Nice, man. Yeah, if anybody from their campaign is listening, man, take note because uh, it's an important, you know, obviously state to to try and lock up and you've got the the voice in the booth down there. Yeah, in the Midwest and Appalachia is the reason that Donald Trump became president Mm -hmm. because if Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania would have gone, or even just Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania would have gone for Hillary, then she would have won the election yeah. on the election college. So like that, this part of the country where me and you live is, I mean, Illinois went Democrat, but the, the, the Midwest, the Rust Belt in Appalachia are like the areas that will make Bernie Sanders win in 2020. Definitely. Anywhere else. I would say to you, I mean, and, and it's easy for me to say because I'm not the one doing it, but you know, if you plan on going to South Carolina or something like that, like reach out, I'm sure they have a Bernie organization there and I'm sure they've yeah. got I don't know, you stay in someone's dorm or they've got a house down yeah. there or something. Yeah, and they got like field offices down there too yeah. because uh, when we're, I think what we'll probably do is drive to the field office and coordinate that. Um, and once they get a field office in Ohio, as I said, that's really going to help yeah, us out a lot. Yeah, sure so if the Bernie campaign is watching, please open a field office in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, sure we, we, it'll all, we're waiting for you. <laughs> it's all going to avalanche down once, like you said, it gets a little bit closer to voting time over there. Um, I give you a lot of credit, man, because... You said you're an av- uh, aviation student, so like, yes, I'm mm-hmm. sure that's not easy and takes up a lot of your time. So, how how has college been for you, and what's what's your you know plan of attack going forward when you graduate? Yeah, so um, as I said, I'm in my fifth year. Most people in aviation take more than four years because the weather in this part of the country is it's cloudy all the time, and like the the type of flying we do, uh, most of it you can't be in the clouds. You have to like fly in, in days of nice weather, and especially it can't be snowing or anything like that because you'll get icing on the wings. So that really delays us a lot. Is that did that affect and, your uh, decision going to? Co- did you know you wanted to do aviation when you went to college? Uh, yeah, I got my private pilot's license when I was in high school, oh, wow. actually. I actually flew a plane before I drove a car. Wow. What, is there an age limit yeah. for that? Uh, you have to be, I think it's, you have to be 16 to start training okay. and 17 to get your license. So I got my license when I was 17 and a half or something what, like that. What, what, um, why did, what, why did that draw interest to you? Uh, um, to be honest, when, like, when you're flying, I've just, I always liked planes when I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, I actually remember my parents taking me to the Pittsburgh airport before 9-11 when you could go through security without a boarding pass yeah. and like go there. And the Pittsburgh airport is kind of known for having like high end shops in the airport. So we'd go and shop and mostly watch airplanes the whole time. So I kind of like planes from a young age. And, and then after 9-11, like I couldn't go to the airport anymore. So I kind of fell away from One it. One of the and planes crashed in Pennsylvania, third, right? Uh, yeah, in Shanksville, which is 60 miles outside of Pittsburgh, wow. probably, yeah. actually. It flew right over Pittsburgh right before it crashed. We're actually very lucky it didn't fall in the city. Yeah. It, it could have been a disaster. But um, when I when I turned 13, I happened to be in, in Target with my mom, and I saw uh, – uh, I always used to look at the PC games because I, I was a huge like video game kid. And there was a game called Microsoft Flight Simulator. And I think I remember I'm like, that this game. This kind of looks interesting. So my – my my mom got it for me for my birthday two weeks later. I started playing it, and within like a week, I'm like, I, this is what I want to do in real life. And and I, I and I started flying, and and I just kind of fell in love with it. And you get to, I mean, you get to get paid to travel the world. How great is that? Yeah. I mean, I already got to have an internship in Alaska because of it. So it's sweet, but it, it is a little. I I know like it's a little bit hypocritical because aviation is really bad for the environment. So I think something I'm interested in, in the future is, and, and you know, ironically or not ironically this might be the one field where even corporations actually might have an interest in becoming more sustainable because it fuel is very expensive it's the number one thing that airlines have to pay for their cost and fuel. if airlines can figure out what fuel you're saying yeah yeah, fuel. Okay. yeah and if airlines can figure out ways to be more sustainable that'll save them millions and millions and millions of dollars so i think the airlines actually have a lot of incentive incentive to try to be more eco-friendly and if i can be outspoken about that as a pilot I think that's a great way to like kind of combine my political passions and my aviation passions. And it's actually an area where it's actually – I don't think it's anti-big business to to have that opinion. I think it's actually something the airlines care about too because even just from a profit margin. Yeah, you should start um, recruiting people who know how to come up with ideas to, to invent something for that. You know, yeah. go that route instead of becoming the pilot. Um, yeah. Do you, I'm not smart enough to be an engineer. No, you seem pretty <laughs> smart. I fly the planes. I can't design them. <laughs> um, I don't mean to put this on your radar, but do you get do you get nervous about flying and you know like uh and I, uh, one of my friends she's an acquaintance but she's a pilot yeah. for uh, I don't think I think yeah. Mar American Airlines or something like that. Yeah. Um, and she said obviously I think when you start out you you have to fly small plane like you're usually flying the smaller planes the the. The smaller the plane, she had said, the pilot is less advanced. Um, yeah, so I, I fly. I used to fly Piper Warriors, and now I fly Piper Arrows, which are they're they're both like four seat single turbo or single propeller uh, engine planes. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference now with the Arrows is it's a little more horsepower, and the landing gear actually come up when you take off. Mm -hmm. The Warriors, the landing gear, they're actually fixed, so you can't even bring the gear Jeez. up. This shows how small and rudimentary they wow. are. Um, Flying, it's been really fun flying the small little planes because, you know, you can fly real low and, and you're a lot slower. So, like, I've flown over my house a billion times and sometimes I've had, like, my, my mom come out in the driveway and do circles over the wow. house a little bit. It's kind of cool. But I'm looking forward to flying the bigger planes just because it's it, it's going to be a different experience, obviously. Like, it's like driving a Honda Civic versus a Ferrari yeah. or something like that. You're moving up to a jet. That's going to be something really big but i i don't necessarily get nervous i had one time where i thought there was something wrong with the plane um it turns out it was just a faulty light wow. and i i diverted to another airport there was nothing wrong i got a little nervous about that but overall i've always kind of been comfortable doing it which i always find weird because i watch videos on youtube of guys who do this parkour on top of skyscrapers yeah, and stuff, stuff i can't watch and it i get too much anxiety i, I get a tingly feeling in my feet yeah. just watching the video and even when i was like a little kid i couldn't stand on the edge of a staircase or a ledge because i'd get like that fear of heights yeah. For some reason, I never get it in an airplane, even though I would get it standing on a cliff. Do you guys so. um, in school? And I know Kyle hates flying. Yeah, so. yeah, he doesn't get on many flights. So when we go to uh, yeah. L.A., and he think he posted a picture outside of his window one time that he got a lot of grief for because it was like farmland, <laughs> and he said something or other, and people were like, "That's just whatever, Kansas or something like yeah. that." Yeah. <laughs> um, Remember that? Do you guys in aviation school? Do you sort of track? maybe what happened with this Kobe Bryant situation and monitor maybe like how to avoid something like whatever happened um, out there? Yeah. So it's a little different because helicopters work a little different than airplanes okay. and we don't have a helicopter school. But one thing that I've really, it, there is nothing that shows the incompetence of the media more than handling any aviation incident. Even the reporting the, of the story. The, like, oh, when all the 737, when the 737 maxes had those crashes in China, yeah. 
I mean, they'd get on and like they call CNN would be like the plane was an Airbus something. I'd be like, no, it wasn't an Airbus. It was a Boeing. It's like saying it was a Ford when it was actually a Chevy or something yeah. like that. Like they don't know anything and they report all this stuff about like they had the media was saying they had special permission to fly. The process they were flying under is called SVFR, special VFR. It's a routine procedure that helicopters do almost all the yeah. time. And yeah. and I feel like they don't CNN, MSNBC, Fox they need to actually hire people who are pilots or who had a history of pilots to actually talk about these things because they, they, these people do minimal research on these plane crashes. Yep. And, and I, I just hate the speculation over the Kobe Bryant crash. Cause everyone, everyone likes to act like they're an NTSB investigator and they know what happened. And I don't think first off, like we need to just stop speculating about it. Cause it's, it's almost even disrespectful to Kobe's family and all the people impacted by it. We need to let the experts kind of get to the bottom of what happened and and then figure it, figure it out. Yeah, that's so well said, man. And, and and it's 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 tough because for media they want to be the first to report the story. So you see TMZ, you know, coming out with their yeah. their article and saying Kobe, and then just four people on the plane, and then it's seven people, and then nine people now. Like, but to your point, it's like we trust all these people who are you know on mainstream TV or whatever, and. You know, they might be intelligent, but they're not educated on every single topic. They're not they're no. not pilots. They're not, you know, they don't know everything. So like it would be like having me on television to analyze the structural reasoning behind a bridge collapse. Yeah. yeah. I don't I have no idea why the bridge collapsed. I'm go ask an engineer. Like Yeah, it's it's a tough it's a tough spot we are in, man, because it's like Twitter, everyone has a voice and everyone can speculate yeah. and some tweet goes viral of someone who seems educated and, and it could just be totally false and someone takes it and runs with it. Um, but that's where we're at now. And there's really, I feel like no turning back on that, but it's just people being more educated on who they listen to and, and reporting stuff to their friends, you know? So like, yeah. you know, Hey, I don't know too much about this, but like, if you want to look up uh, this airplane and do your own research, that's hopefully being how we, right how we become it's way more important than being first. Yes. Like I, I'd rather take the time and get it right mm -hmm. than be the first one to report it. And even going off of that, it's it's better to admit that you don't know or that you're wrong about something than it is to just like come up with some BS because you don't know it and you're trying to to act like you know. Yeah. I think you've seen the the old Jay Leno clips probably where he would ask people, "What do you think about us bombing some country? That country doesn't even exist." Yeah. And the people actually answer the question yeah. as if they know about it. And it's like. Look, there's no shame in saying I don't know. Exactly. Because the only reason you're going to get smarter is be like, I have no idea. We have these things. Just go on Google and look it up. Yeah. No, it's you. You make some great points, man. And it, it's it's okay to say I don't know. It's okay to say you know, hey, yeah. just look it up, man, or don't don't trust my answer. But you know, here's what I think about it, or something like that. I think that's the hardest thing, though, is that people in general are. And, and this was one thing that was really hard for me to understand for a, a lot of years talking politics to people people are always more motivated by emotion than they are by facts mm -hmm. and that's really hard because i'm i'm a very fact-based person ask anyone who knows me like if you show me facts to believe something i will believe it if the facts show that it's true so many people but it's, it's instinctual to to react with emotions you know if so you, yeah, you stub your toe you're going to react with like a screaming yeah. ow in pain like it's just natural yeah, but I, I it's just from a political perspective we need to train ourselves to like look at the facts of a situation and rather than the emotions and and i think like people did that with kobe because uh, kobe was a little bit before my time i remember like the last few years of kobe obviously living in ohio everyone's massive about lebron yeah. he's from Akron. Yep. But and and like I'm from Pittsburgh and we're not really a basketball city. We're more like I, I follow the Penguins hockey more than more than I do basketball. But like I still remember him from my childhood. And I mean I listen to you and Corin or you and Kyle talk about basket or Kobe all the yeah. time on Kyle and Corin. And so like it impacted me and, and and I was sad about it. But I didn't like move my sadness into like jumping to some sort of like I'm gonna blame the pilot. I'm gonna blame their traffic controllers. Just like hold back wait to see what happens yeah. you know no that's a great point um i give you a lot of credit man it seems like you've got a good head on your shoulder and you've got a good outlook on you know how um how to look at you know the world and how to see people um you said you've traveled to alaska have you traveled to any other places outside of the u.s um so i've been to british columbia and i've been to ontario and canada i'm going to quebec next summer 
but I haven't really been anywhere else outside the U.S. I, I got to go to Hawaii this summer for a training for my internship nice. in Alaska, which was really cool. But, you know, it, it's funny because I always wanted to study abroad when I was in college. And I realized, like, with my major, I was never going to really have that opportunity. Um, so going to Alaska was kind of like even – honestly, I realized it was even probably better than studying abroad because when you're in – like, I wasn't even just in, like, the cities of Alaska. I was in communities that didn't have roads. You had to fly to get to them. That's where I lived in a town called King Salmon. It has, like, 300 people, permanent residents. I think of the movie so, um, The Proposal. I think they went to Alaska and had to, like, fly to they, some – I have not – I don't know movies at all. Oh, I'm a music you got to watch that one, man. It's Ryan Reynolds and Sandra Bullock. It's just a – it's a heart warmer. <laughs> but no, I think yeah, I think they fly to Alaska and then they have to fly to some other little town. So I I, I can yeah. picture what you're telling me. Yeah, and like I actually visited Barrow, Alaska for one overnight and 24 hours of sunshine because you're so high up north. You're way in the Arctic Circle, and I mean like the the it's just like dirt paths everywhere, and like the the culture and the people. It's it's so different than anything else. And I mean I haven't been to Europe to compare it, but. I've had some people who've been to both tell me like Alaska is even more extreme than going to kind of another country, even though it's the same language and technically the same country. It's just so different. But honestly, the thing that it just enforced my value of is, is how important nature is and how much like suburbanization and urban sprawl and kind of just industrialism has really destroyed nature. And we don't even realize it. We go to wild places in the lower 48, like you've probably been up to like Vermont or something like that, you know, along the drive up to Montreal when you're going through the mountains yep. in New York and it seems like a wild and natural place. Most of those forests were probably deforested 100 years ago, and now they're just growing back. And when you're in Alaska, you could be walking down the street, and a grizzly bear crosses the street right in front of you. It's just like a casual thing to have happen. Yeah. I saw wolves and foxes. And, and like we have black bears in Pittsburgh, but they're, they're not common sightings. And, and when everything is there in Alaska, you're like, this is a truly untouched place. Like This is the way it has been for thousands of years because the native Alaskan people never – like their values were to live with nature and not to destroy yeah. it. And it was a really eye-opening experience just to like see that firsthand. It kind of reinforced a lot of the things I believe about how like nature is really important. Yeah. I think a lot of people that grew up in cities don't realize that because they don't live amongst nature, but even cities are more sustainable when we take care of the nature around Definitely. them. Definitely. Yeah, it's a it's a great point and yeah, I know even for me and I I I would feel I'm pretty well traveled, um, but you don't understand or realize how much people rely on the environment outside of, you know, being able to go to, you know, a stop and shop or whatever supermarket you have by yeah. you and just buy whatever you need. It's like um, in Dominican Republic, when I was with my brother, there's people climbing up trees to cut down coconuts because, you know, they're drinking the coconut water or they're yeah. cooking with um, like this guy opened up some plant and there was like this lotion in it that he said was shampoo. Like, Wow. It's 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 incredible, and to your point, it is eye opening, and it, it makes you realize how important um, the environment is and taking care of it. Because like, without it, we're not you know we're not creating all of these products. Uh, he had mentioned yeah, and everything we get is from nature yes. too. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, the best thing about being in Alaska was sometimes my coworkers who their families would subsistence fish for salmon. Like my one coworker, she'd come into work sometimes and just give me a whole fillet of salmon. I actually still have three of them in my wow. freezer, and because uh, I brought home like forty pounds of it. And she'd just give us it. This is something that would cost 20, 30 bucks down here in Ohio yeah. if you go buy it at the store, which, you know, for, for like two or three pounds of it. And she just, up there, it's so common that, like, I actually learned how to cut up the fish and process them. And we call it filleting the fish. Mm -hmm. And we would just dump the roe, which is the eggs, we would dump it kind of just into a big trash bin. That stuff is a delicacy down here, and it's only served in high-end restaurants. And up there, it's literally just trash that we comp that we just threw into the dump. Yeah, because it's because they take such good care of the nature up there that like their resources are just so common. It's okay to waste yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Um, <clears throat> just to wrap things up a little bit here. Yeah, how do you um, envision things playing out? Um, and are you nervous that things? Um, could get a little dicey with how we've seen Iowa play out in the DNC, you know, getting pretty involved with what's going on. Yeah. So for the longest time, like Warren was really the biggest thing I was worried about in terms of somebody beating Bernie. Warren, Warren and Biden were my biggest concerns. And now it seems like Biden is going off a cliff. I mean, yeah. every time he opens his mouth, he says something stupid, oh, yeah. uh, whether it's talking about corn pop or like wh whatever. Touching he's people about. and, you know, like. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, Warren kind of, you know, did that 
thing where she tried to accuse Bernie of being sexist, mm-hmm. which was obviously probably just her, him misquoting something about how women genuinely have it tougher because of sexism. Yes. I guarantee that the point Bernie was trying to yep. make. Bernie's been pro women woman for forty yep. years, so like no. And you know, I think she's kind of fallen off because she backed off on Medicare for all. And now it seems like Buttigieg is the one that's a threat. But the thing is, in the downline states, Buttigieg pulls very poorly against Bernie. Yep. And I think it's going to be one of those situations where, like, the establishment vote might actually be really split. And, and that means, like, Bernie can just kind of rise up the same way Trump rose up. Them. So if I was to make a prediction, I would say that Bernie's going to win. But he's 10 points down. Or else he, exactly. like, more stuff could happen, like what happened in Iowa. I mean, it looks like Bernie's going to end up winning Iowa at the end of the day, but barely. And barely's not enough. We need. I mean, in the uh, in the eyes of everybody, it's already like Buttigieg is yes. one with you know the way the yeah. media is reporting it and the way that Pete is taking his whether Bernie or not whether Bernie won, which I believe he won by yes. a substantial more amount than what yeah, even people are saying. Um, it's scary that you know Pete was allowed to do what he did, yeah. um, and then who's to say if Bernie wins again in New Hampshire, uh, what the media is going to say this yeah. time? You know, like it, it, I'm just nervous. Because I didn't see this coming in Iowa, um, and I, I just don't know what to expect. What, going what forward, do you think? You know, you think Bernie's going to Like again, I don't know too much about you know like the in the ins and outs of what goes on. I think he's got a lot of momentum. I text Kyle all the time, and I'm like, "What on in New Hampshire? Is he doing well?" And uh, he's like, "It's getting." You see all the rallies of people there, in New Hampshire, um, and and Kyle is assuring me, man, that if it is Buttigieg, to your point, he doesn't have the you know he doesn't have <laughs> yeah. the black support. Yeah. He doesn't have. Um, he have the power in other states to really um, win the candidacy. Bernie's done a lot better job um, of reaching out to, I think, minorities and talking about social issues than in 2016. That yes. was one of his weaknesses this time. And I think he realized it, it wasn't that Bernie wasn't there on minority issues and social issues. It's that his messaging wasn't good enough on it. But now he's really like made the mm-hmm. effort to kind of be that candidate. And if you look at like the the Muslim vote, and it was over 90% for Bernie. He's super popular with Hispanics. I mean, he's really made an effort to get out to people who speak Spanish and all that. And Mm -hmm. I I think if I think even Bernie's starting to get more support among African-Americans because he's he's really showing that he's kind of the the candidate for everybody. And I think he's doing a really good job of that in 2020. And I think his I I don't know if you watched the debate on Friday, but I think it was Bernie's best debate performance I've ever seen. And that includes all the ones in 2016. He he responded to every attack, low blow attack. He responded perfectly. And, and I mean, what a moment when, you know, they tried to bring up the Hillary Clinton thing and Joe Biden gave him a hug like Biden yeah, gave Bernie a hug. And Klobuchar said, I like I you, Bernie. I mean, th- I that I couldn't imagine. I, I, I almost like I was getting excited thinking about Hillary's reaction, watching Joe Biden give Bernie a hug. She must have yeah. had an aneurysm watching that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was nice to see. That was just like a that felt like just a warm yeah. moment. You know, it was. A little bit sad that like all the candidates aren't just like, you know, I like Bernie because they are just regular people. And even Bernie always says before, even if he throws a rightful attack at um, Biden, he'll be like, Joe's a friend of mine. You know, this isn't like I'm not going to bash him. So like he'll say that he'll preface it with that and then hit him with like a but he did vote for this or that because like there are stuff that he could get called out on. But like he's not going to attack someone. And I'm sure if he was asked the same question about anybody else on stage of Hillary Clinton accusing them, he'd be like. I'm a friend yes. of theirs. So like what she said well, is and, ridiculous you know, Bernie, and, and, and like, wouldn't stay Bernie silent. campaigned like at 35 events or 40 events for Hillary in 2016. Yeah. But I, I, that's what yeah. I am most amazed at about with Bernie is how he's able to like not – I mean I think sometimes he needs to like go after candidates a little bit more. I'm really glad he went after Buttigieg for having the billionaires in the debate. But I'm amazed yeah, that Bernie that doesn't – like he's able to hold back in – because I think unfortunately like we live in a world where if Bernie would be like – you know, Warren tried to pit me as a sexist or, you know, all the attacks that we like to give on the other candidates. Like the media would just use that to be like Bernie's divisive, Bernie, this, that, you know, it's, it's almost like the. So, yeah. And it's, it's frustrating because you say he had a great debate. I think he had a great debate. A lot of people say that it was one of his best debates, but then right after the debate, you know, the pundits are there like, this is Klobuchar's best night. And I'm like, go the, go the fuck away with that stuff, man. So it's frustrating, um, but just to wrap this up, man, I I appreciate all that you're doing. You know, I, I have a lot of respect for you. I know my sister's in Colorado. She told me the other day she was knocking awesome. on people's doors, and I said I give you a lot of credit because it's not. I just I I don't I can't I don't I can't do it. Maybe I should just 
freaking yeah, do even, it. Yeah, but like oh, you having this show, like, has probably reached a lot of people too. I mean, cool. Yeah, I, that's what that's what I'm hoping for. Um, is there anything? people can do to like do you want people to yeah let me like you? I'll, people... I'll go ahead and uh like plug whatever you got to plug give give a little uh mention of all my social medias and stuff so we are yeah go Twitter, for whatever you got to go for cats four b-o-b-c-a-t-s-f-o-r that is our organization twitter so if you guys want to follow that um i'd also recommend following the national students for bernie chapter and that's not just college students if you're a grad student a phd student a high school student a middle school student if you support bernie like it's all students for Bernie, no matter how old you are, no matter what student level you are. Um, if you guys want to, I, I have a YouTube account. It's Andrew Gudarelli. I've done one political talk show like a year ago. I, I haven't uploaded since, but if you guys want to follow that, I might make some videos at some point. And then my Twitter, it's A underscore Gudarelli, uh, which is which is the spelling of my last name. Well, obviously, you have that through Skype. So, um, uh, yeah. yeah, you guys can follow that. Um, other than that, I mean, I would say... I would just say to everyone out there, like, try to find if there's a Bernie group at your school. And if there's not, it's not too late to start one, especially, like, if you go to a school in a state like Pennsylvania or a state that their primary is not till late April or early May, like, you have a couple months to kind of get, like, the infrastructure in. And if you can, you know, take the next three or four weeks to get a group big enough to try to organize a rally or something like that, get Bernie to your school, that'd be really big because, you know, Young people, 18 to 35, and even maybe 36 to 50, like those two age groups, but especially 18 to 35, are the ones who support Bernie the most. And if we can get those people out to vote, there if those people turn out in high numbers, Bernie will win easily, 100%. So I would say just do what you can at your campus, even at your high school, storm a, form a Students for Bernie group. It, it, it wouldn't hurt. I mean, I know high schools have after school clubs and stuff like that. Form a burn group. Yeah. And, and more than anything, you know, just face to face conversations. Talk to your friends, your family, your bus driver, your teachers, and everyone you know, right? And, and, and you know, just, just mention issues and then try to bring Bernie into the conversation and see what they think about it, you know? Yeah, that's great, man. I, like I said, I give you a lot of credit. Um, I'm very appreciative that you reached out to me. Uh, you're very smart. You're very educated. You're doing great things. Um, uh, good luck with your aviation. We'll, you know, be in touch yeah. through Twitter and stuff like that. And, and you know, thank you for educating people. And thank you again yeah, for what you're doing. Yeah, thank you for being honest. I kind of reached good. out to you, but I figured I'm not I'm not here to promote myself. Great. I'm here to get Bernie to win. And it's not me. It's us. That's that's Bernie's campaign. So that's I figured that's like this is too important to worry about that kind of stuff. We just got to get our message out and fight for Bernie together. That's great, man. Andrew, thank you, dude. Um, and thanks for thanks for talking, and we'll be in touch All right, soon, peace. dude. All right, later. And...